a very good morning to one and all, and a special welcome to any visitor or guest that we have with us this morning. We're glad that you could be with us, and may the Lord bless us as we worship Him together. Just a couple of quick announcements before we go to our pre-service song. Uh, just concerning Ladies' Fellowship, the books are here, and they're in a box on the back table, and so the ladies who are signed up for the Ladies' Fellowship, uh, you can grab your books from the back table right after the worship service this morning or this afternoon. Uh, and also just a reminder uh, that there is singing for the seniors at the Remoka uh, uh, this evening um, at 6.30. And so uh, if you are able, or at least please make every effort to uh, join the group as they sing there for the seniors, which is greatly appreciated. Uh, let us at this time turn in our hymnals to number 398 for our pre-service song, The Church's One Foundation is Jesus Christ, Her Lord. And let's remain seated to sing the four stanzas. Our God calls us to worship with these words from Psalm 96. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Proclaim the good news of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his wonders among all peoples. And congregation, this is what we are here to do, to declare the glory of God and to praise his name. Let us bow in a moment of silent prayer and ask the Lord to help us to prepare our hearts for worship. Number 307 is our opening hymn of praise to our God. Ye who his temple throng, it's based on Psalm 149. We rise 
to sing the three stanzas of number 307 in praise of our God. Congregation, it is our heart's confession that our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Receive his greeting, grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father, through his Son, Jesus Christ, in fellowship with the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Let us listen to the word of God as it comes to us from Exodus chapter 20 and where we have declared for us the Ten Commandments, the Ten Words of the Covenant of our God, the how now shall we live as God's covenant people. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands to those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work. You, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor's. Our Lord Jesus Christ summarized these ten commandments for us into two great commandments, in Matthew 22 when he said that the first and great commandment is this that you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart with all your soul with all your mind and with all your strength and the second he said is like it you shall love your neighbor as you love yourself in congregation which of us can say this morning that we have loved the Lord our God with heart soul mind and strength which of us can say uh, genuinely and sincerely that we have loved our neighbor as we love ourselves we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God but that is not where it ends. We also look to the mercy and the compassion and the grace of a God who, is, who looks upon us in the misery of our sins and saves us and washes us and renews us. 
Uh, we read of this God in uh, Ephesians chapter 2, where Paul writes in verses 4 and following, but God, and this is in light of our deadness in sin, our lostness in sin, our inclinations to follow uh, our evil uh, inclinations and to follow the ways of the devil. Uh, but God, in spite of these things, uh, who is this God who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And we listen to some of those terms. And sometimes we can gloss over these things a little too easily. Uh, we read of a God who is rich in mercy. He, he possesses not a little bit of mercy, but a tremendous amount of mercy. Um, an amount of mercy that cannot even be fathomed. Uh, his love is described as great, uh, huge. It is uh, beyond our imagining. It reaches as high as the heavens and is deeper than the oceans. And he, we are told here that it is by grace we have been saved. Uh, grace, again, boys and girls, means God's undeserving favor, giving to us something that we do not and cannot deserve. And, and this reminds us, this passage reminds us, on the one hand, about how lost we are, how incapable, uh, incapable we are, how hopeless we are in and of ourselves, and yet how good is the Lord our God, and how merciful and kind and compassionate He is that He forgives us of our sins through Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Number 430 is our song of response. Uh, Lord, like the publican, I stand. And here we admit our guilt and we look to the Lord for His grace and for His mercy. Number 430, let's remain seated to sing the four stanzas. Let us go to our God in our morning congregational prayer. Let us all pray. <coughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have indeed been merciful to us, that you have looked upon us in our sin, and that you are a God of grace, giving to us what we certainly do not deserve and cannot deserve, and you have saved us by your Son, Christ Jesus. We pray, Heavenly Father, that we, as we gather in your house this morning, that as we uh, throng together in your temple, as we congregate, as we commune with each other, that our hearts may be fixed upon you, that our focus and our intention this morning may be that you would be praised and exalted as we join together in worship this morning. We pray that you would keep from us every distraction, every worry from the past week, every worry from the coming week, and that we may indeed uh, relish this opportunity that you give us to be spiritually refreshed as we uh, focus upon your greatness and your glory, your love and your compassion. And Father, help us then by your Holy Spirit that we may lift our hearts to the heavens, recognizing where our help comes from. It is the Lord, the maker of all heaven and earth. Indeed, Father, help us to recognize all creation all around us, 
and even in the functioning of this body, even in the functioning of our bodies, that all things in creation declare your glory and your power and evidence is the, the hand of an intelligent designer, that these things have come into being not by chance. Not, it is not that nothing gave birth to nothing, but it is you, the eternal God, the all-powerful God, the unchanging God who has uh, spoken by your divine creative breath and called all things into being. Indeed, Father, your love for us cannot be fathomed, the depths of it cannot be plumbed. We cannot fully understand it because we know that when we look at ourselves honestly, we are not deserving of your love. We have done nothing to make you take notice of us or to in any way uh, make you have mercy on us. Uh, your, your faithfulness toward us is, is beyond us uh, because we are not faithful to you. We break your commandments every day in thought, word, and deed, and we are living examples of of, of sinfulness and the product of sin in our lives. Father, we confess that quite often we, we do not even recognize our sin because our hearts are so dulled and uh, we have become complacent. We have become apathetic uh, in many ways. Father, we do not recognize the pride and selfishness that, is, that influences everything we do. We do not recognize the sinful thoughts, the words that come out of our mouths, even the deeds of our hands that are sinful before you. We perhaps... Uh, uh, recognize the, the greater sins and yet the little ones which are just as important, Father. We either do not see these things or we take them for granted. Father, we even take you for granted. And quite often we think that uh, we can use our freedom in Christ to indulge the sinful nature. And for these things we ask your forgiveness. We thank you for your faithfulness, seen in the blessings which are new every morning in our lives. And we praise you that you are holy, that there is no sin in you that your eyes are too pure to look upon evil before you the wicked cannot stand. And yet, Father, you have uh, taken those who are unholy to be yours. You have covenanted with us. You have declared to us that you shall be a God to us and we shall be your people and this solely out of your mercy and grace. Thank you for Christ Jesus, our Savior, our hope, our heart's desire, our joy, our reason uh, for being triumphant in this life already, our uh, reason for uh, already knowing that we are possessors of eternal life. Thank you for what he has done. Thank you that he is God come in the flesh, God incarnate, God with us, who took upon himself on the cross our sins and our shame and our guilt, and he paid for them by bearing your wrath upon himself. We thank you for your Holy Spirit, whom having risen to the, uh, ascended to the right hand of God that our Lord Jesus Christ has poured out upon his church, the giver of faith, the convictor of sins, the one who cleanses us and renews us and, uh, into the image of our Savior Christ Jesus. Thank you, Father, for your blessing upon us in our lives, in our families. Thank you for the safety that you blessed us with in this past week. Uh, keeping us from dangers and harm that perhaps we don't even know of. Uh, thank you for the health and strength that we are able to enjoy. Thank you for providing for us through the work of our hands, our food and clothes and shelter. Thank you, Father, for blessings uh, to individuals and families in this congregation. We thank you for our sister, Ina Hammer, that she may be able to celebrate another birthday this coming Wednesday. Thank you for the years of her life. And thank you that uh, through all the ups and downs and difficulties of her life, uh, as her body is quite often racked with pain and uh, difficulties, she has gone through uh, much uh, troubles with, uh, with colds that have been prolonged and, and have affected her, uh, her voice and throat. And, and, and uh, we, pray, Father, we thank you, Father, that you have blessed her and brought her through, that she too may rejoice with us in your goodness and in your grace. And we pray that you would continue to bless her in the year ahead as uh, she looks forward to um, her MRI and also maybe surgery on her back, perhaps her neck, uh, to, um, to uh, take away some of the pain that she has been experiencing and discomfort. And we pray that you would bless her with continued um, joy in her Savior. 
And we pray for, uh, for Haas as well, her husband, as he has been experiencing some uh, balance issues lately, uh, experiencing some falls. We pray that you would protect him and watch over him and bless him, Father, that uh, he too would receive, um, whether it be medical treatment or uh, just uh, your, your healing hand upon him, um, uh, and that uh, he may uh, be able to continue and function and be the, uh, the, the help and the caregiver for Ina that he needs to be. Father, we pray for those who are struggling in our congregation with ongoing health concerns. We pray for our sister May as the, uh, with the progress of the MS and the struggles and discomfort that this brings. We pray for your watchful care over her. We pray that you would grant unto her your healing mercies. We pray, if it be your will, we pray for your sustaining grace in her life. We pray for our sister Doris as she has been experiencing uh, great tiredness lately, uh, uh, spiking with her, um, her uh, blood sugar level, uh, with uh, aches and pains of the body. And uh, we pray, Father, that uh, you would bless her and uh, continue to provide for her. And above all, Father, uh, cause her and all who perhaps who cannot be here and uh, perhaps miss uh, worship from time to time because of illness, that they may always know that they belong to you, uh, body and soul, and that they are always yours, and they are part of the covenant family. We think of Annalise Poles, uh, our young sister as well too, Father, uh, with the struggles of her young life. We pray that you would bless her and sustain her. We pray for her protection that you would guard uh, her bones, that you would bless her, that uh, through research and development that they may be able to even uh, find uh, the solution to her, to her illness. Father, we also give you thanks this morning for uh, infant Brindley direct in the uh, Stollery Hospital. We, we, are marvel, we, uh, we, we, we marvel, Father, at your greatness and your goodness that you have blessed her with such improvement and that you have blessed the work of the doctors and nurses there and the care that she has received and medication that uh, she has now been able to be taken off all of the, uh, the machines that was keeping her going and uh, even the breathing apparatus. And, and we pray, Father, uh, that you would bless her with continued progress uh, and as we know, Father, that there is always the threat and chance that uh, there may be a reoccurrence of uh, the spike in her, in her uh, heart rate, we pray for her protection. And we give you all praise and all glory for how you have worked in this child's life and how you have blessed her parents and, been, and surrounded them with your comfort and nearness. Father, we also uh, remember our sister Frances Veslice, who is in the Red Deer Hospital and continues to be there, uh, suffering great discomfort and pain due her, to her cancer, and now the stint that has been put into her esophagus this past Friday. Father, we pray that uh, you will do all that is good and best for her, as you know what is good and best, uh, and certainly we do not know. Uh, we pray for your comfort to her as she lies in bed, that she may receive comfort from the Holy Scriptures as she reads them, as she prays. Uh, we pray for your blessing upon the, the, the care that she is receiving, uh, whether it be through uh, the uh, oncologist in uh, Edmonton, uh, whenever they, they go, uh, and uh, certainly, Father, through your blessing upon uh, her uh, with your healing mercies, if it be your will. We pray uh, for Marinas, her husband. We pray for her children and loved ones that you would give to them the encouragement of heart that they need. And we thank you, Father, for their strong faith. And we pray that uh, uh, for Francis and for uh, Marinas and the children that uh, you would continue to, um, to, to be walk with them through this, this very difficult journey. Father, we pray for all the caregivers in our midst. We pray that you would uphold them and strengthen them daily and granting unto them the spiritual, uh, physical, and emotional needs that they need from day to day. We pray for our elderly, for the struggles that come with aging. We think of our dear sister, uh, Mrs. Brink, that you would be near to her in Ramoka and uh, bless her heart as uh, she uh, is not able to be with us. And yet, uh, Father, worship is to her the greatest joy. We pray that she may find much comfort as she continues to read your word. Be near to those with child in our midst as well. Continue to watch over those covenant children that you have conceived and created in their wombs. We pray that you would watch over them during the gestation process and when the time comes that there may be safe deliveries and healthy children. Bless our young couples, especially those who are uh, first timers uh, taking care of their children and have been entrusted with this great responsibility. Uh, grant to our young mothers 
the health and strength that they need. Bless them with enough sleep and bless them uh, that as they care for their children that they would also, um, they, they too also would be cared for. Bless our husbands and our young husbands that they would be, uh, they would recognize the needs of their wives and they would be loving husbands. And bless us as uh, married couples and at every age that we would love and uh, respect and uh, seek to build up each other in our most holy faith. Father, worldwide we think of uh, the crisis uh, in West Africa with this Ebola uh, epidemic. We pray for uh, the research to be done, that a, the cure may be found. We pray for the care that is needed. We pray that uh, more hands would, uh, uh, would uh, uh, um, arrive to, to help out in this uh, very grave situation. We pray that uh, uh, you would uh, bless um, uh, the, the efforts that are being made that this uh, virus would not spread uh, throughout the world. And uh, Father, again in these things we, we pray that every, all, all men would look to you and be reminded that uh, as we see famines and pestilences and wars and rumors of wars happening and increasing, that uh, we may know that we do indeed live in these last days and we are to look to you and look to the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in him. We pray, Father, for the day, and especially, Father, as we hear of the wars and the, uh, the atrocities that are happening all across the world, we pray that the day may quickly come when the nations would beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks, and true peace may reign under the Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ. Bless the gospel as it goes forth into the world that many who are hostile to the gospel, even those in ISIS who are doing these horrific things, these beheadings and so on. We pray that they would come to know the Lord Jesus Christ and repent of their sins and know what it is to be truly forgiven and uh, to fight, instead of a violent fight, to fight the good fight of faith with us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Congregation, please turn with me for our scripture reading this morning to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. You say, why are we turning to 2 Timothy? We're in Mark. Uh, this, is, uh, the, uh, this, uh, this sermon will be, in fact, the, um, this, the sermon that the elders will be referring to as they come to your house this year in their elder visits. And they will particularly be focusing on verses 14 to 17 of 2 Timothy 3. Um, and so we want to uh, listen to this passage this morning and uh, we want to pay special attention um, as uh, we will be reflecting on this uh, passage with the elders in our elder visits this morning. Second Timothy, of course, is written by the Apostle Paul to the young pastor Timothy. And uh, Timothy at this time, we believe, and this is based on uh, chapter 1, verses uh, of 1 Timothy. In 1 Timothy 1 verse 3, Paul talks about um, urging uh, Timothy to remain in Ephesus. And so we believe that these two letters were written to Timothy when he was in Ephesus. And uh, Paul, of course, at this time, as later on he mentions about being in chains and uh, his life being already poured out as a drink offering. Uh, the time of his departure is at hand. And so we believe that this was, was uh, written by Paul when he was in Rome in chains and uh, facing execution, uh, which would happen eventually, according to church tradition, that he would uh, be beheaded for his faith. And so he writes this letter to Timothy. And let us read chapter 3 uh, with special focus on verses 14 to 17. Paul writes under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to Timothy, but know this, that in the last days perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, and from such people turn away. For of this sort are those who creep into households and make captives of gullible women, loaded down with sins, led away by various lusts, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now as Janes and Jambres resisted Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds, disapproved concerning the faith. But they will progress no further, for their folly will be manifest to all, as theirs also was. 
But you have carefully followed my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, love, perseverance, persecutions, afflictions, which happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, and out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. But evil men and impostors will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. And here's our text. But you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Our song of preparation is number 451, Take Time to Be Holy. Uh, not really, we rise to sing the four stanzas of number 451. Again, congregation, I think you would uh, certainly profit if you, are, if you were able to keep your Bibles open to 2 Timothy chapter 3 as we look at this passage this morning, uh, paying a st special attention as this will be our elder visit sermon. Congregation of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the exhortation here in our text is to continue in the things we have learned and become assured of. And this text, if we listen to it very carefully, it, it comes as a a tap on the shoulder, a little jab in the ribs. And if we're honest, we realize that we need this from time to time because there are always the temptations to shift our feet, spiritually speaking, to let our eyes wander, to let our shoulders slump and settle back into our easy chairs for a nice snooze, spiritually speaking. But we're reminded as this passage very blatantly brings out for us, we are reminded here that it's when the church gets sleepy and begins to get relaxed, when we begin to neglect God's word and to take God's word for granted, the enemy advances. False teachers and teachers and teachings arise in the church. 
ungodly behavior is cultivated and even protected. Worldliness gains more ground in the hearts of God's people, and the church, to use the image that Jesus used, the church can very easily become a whitewashed tomb, shiny and pretty on the outside, but inside just full of dead bones. Well, how are we to guard against these things? We're to listen to the advice of Paul here as it's given to, to him through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. We are to continue in the things we have learned and become assured of. Now, in our elder visits this season, we'll be talking about these things, and we'll be talking about this passage, and we'll be talking about how we see ourselves as a church, as members of this congregation, how faithful we are individually, as families, as a church family, We'll be thinking about how we are influenced or perhaps whether or not we are influenced by the, by the times and the culture in which we live. And we'll, we'll be encouraged once again to continue in the things we have learned and, to become, and we have become assured of. And we'll be reminded of the necessity of the Bible for us as God's people, that it is to be the center of our lives what we gather around and what we feed off of as individuals and as families each and every day, and how we are to be using the Bible to be growing and increasing in the knowledge of God through His Word. And so our theme this morning, as we look at 2 Timothy 3, verses 14 to 17, is this, Christ commands us, because ultimately we know this is Christ's Word, spoken by His Holy Spirit through Paul, Christ commands us to persevere, that is to stay the course, to continue, Christ commands us to persevere in faith in these last days. We'll see in the first place our nurture in Scripture. That is our nourishment, our nourishment, our upbringing in, in Scripture, how we have been fed in the Holy Scriptures, and in the second place, the trustworthiness of Scripture. And so our nurture in Scripture, the trustworthiness of Scripture. Now, as Christ commands us to persevere, that is to stay the course, to stick to the task, hold fast to our calling, as Christ commands us to persevere in our faith in these last days, we want to re be reminded in the first place of our nurture in Scripture. Paul writes to Timothy to continue in the things he had learned and become assured of. Now, as we said, most likely Timothy was in Ephesus at this time, and Paul was in Rome in chains, fully expecting to be executed at some point in the near future. And he writes to, to give Timothy then some final instructions as to the work that he must continue in, and uh, to instruct him, as he was given by the Holy Spirit, of the challenges that uh, Timothy would face in his life. And of course, this passes on and into our hands, the challenges that the church will face in these last days. And the Greek word translated continue means to remain. It means to abide, uh, persist in. Timothy, in other words, uh, we uh, uh, must not deviate from his course. He must not begin to compromise or take for granted what he has learned. He must not slacken the pace. It was vital that he do this. And this is true for all of us as well, for the church in every age. Because to do so, to begin to compromise and take what we have come to learn and been assured of for granted is dangerous, and it is potentially devastating for the church. Well, how so? Well, if we go back to chapter 3, verse 1, we hear Paul saying this, but know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. Now, Paul talks about perilous times coming in these last days. Uh, what do we mean by last days, boys and girls? Uh, we're talking about the period between the ascension of Jesus and his second coming. The period between the ascension of Jesus and his second coming. These are the last days. In fact, uh, if we uh, listen to uh, how Peter speaks in, in uh, Acts chapter 2, verse 17, quoting Joel, the prophet in the Old Testament, uh, Peter announces to the crowds on the day of Pentecost, and it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams, etc., etc. And so we this has happened. The Spirit has been poured out, and so we are living in these last days. People, people are being converted from every tribe and nation and tongue. As we get closer to the second coming of Christ, we can expect that things will get even worse. There will be greater persecution, greater rebellion against God and His Christ. But, you know, already we certainly see a lot that has been predicted happening now already. There's famines and diseases. 
You think about the Ebola crisis in, in West Africa. There's ro ro uh, wars and rumors of wars, uh, atro atrocious things, horrific things that are happening in the world today. Car bombings in Syria, beheadings in, in uh, different uh, parts of the Middle East, godlessness uh, all over the world is on the increase. The hearts of Christians even growing cold. We're already seeing the perilous times and seasons that Paul says will come. And Paul goes on to list off a number of ways in verses 2 to 5 in which the increase of godliness can be observed. He speaks of men being lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God having a form of godliness but denying its power and from such people turn away. And as we listen to this, who can deny that we do indeed live already in such times? We live in an affluent province. We live in a country that allows its citizens the freedom and financial ability to give free expression to their human nature, which is not always a good thing. In fact, from what we're seeing, it, is, it can be quite a terrible thing when humans are allowed uh, the freedom to indulge their sinful nature and to express uh, what are the inclinations of their uh, basic human nature. What is the result of this kind of freedom and financial um, uh, freedom that we have in our country, in our province? We see self-love on the increase. We see an obsession with money and material things more and more, pride and boasting in what people possess. We live in a time when blasphemy, what is blasphemy, boys and girls? The dishonoring of the name of God, people taking the name of the Lord in, uh, in vain, denying the power of God. And blasphemy today, in the day and age in which we live here in North America, all across the world, this is seen as a right. It is my right to say, I don't believe in God, I have no use for God. And any kind of promotion, any kind of declaration of a unique path to God, for Christians to say, Jesus is the only way, uh, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through Him. Uh, or any kind of an expression of, an, of a one understanding of God. There is only one path and only one God. This is seen by the world today as closed-minded and ignorant and intolerant. Religion and spirituality must cover everything or nothing. We live in a time when we see it, when people see it as safe to say, we don't need God Bible nor church, because these are shackles, these are chains that held us back from indulging our urges all along. This is Victorian, it is old fashioned. We should be able to express ourselves expre uh, and, and um, indulge in, in any indulgence that we would like. And what has been the result? We see it happening again and again if we follow the news, if we read what's happening in the world. We see the push more and more to eliminate male and female distinctions. Gender-neutral bathrooms are becoming more normal in schools and colleges. Parents are encouraged to help their children transition to the gender of their choice, regardless of whether they were born a boy or a girl. Progress continues towards the normalization of same-sex relationships within society. People want that to be accepted. It has to become normal. And anyone who dares to question evolution has no place in the world of teaching. They, they don't want to hear of a designer. They don't want to hear of an intelligent design. Paul says that in these last days, uh, the world would be characterized as well by disobedience to parents, unthankfulness, unholiness. Again, things are, we see already in our day. The self-centeredness, the self-indulgence, disrespect for authority. And we could go on and on. We see all around us people who are unloving, unforgiving, slanderous without self-control, brutal. Again, think of the beheadings that are happening in the Middle East. Despisers of good, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Perilous, terrible times indeed. And this is how the Bible describes these last days. And what is so disturbing, dear brothers and sisters, is that all of these things are not only seen in the world, they're seen in the church as well. It's not confined to the world. The world just flaunts it more. But who would deny that we live in a day and age when self-love is a very big part of the character of the people in the church today. And that self-love is expressed in the love of money, boasting, and pride. 
And so the, the times and the cultures that we live have influenced and seeped into the church as well and filtered its way into the hearts of God's people. Financial independence, you see, is not always a blessing. Who would deny that the church has its share of blasphemers, those who bring shame to God's name by their life and by their behavior, Sunday Christians we might call them, hypocrites. It is unquestionable that the church includes those who are disobedient to parents, who are unholy, unloving, headstrong, and worldly. It is undeniable that the church has among its members those who have a form of godliness but deny its power, who secretly are corrupt and unconverted, who do not love the Lord but love the world. And some of these things live in each and every one of our hearts as well. And we need to take precautions against these influences and inclinations. Well, how do we do that? We continue in the things we have learned and become assured of. We have been and are in the process of being nurtured, nourished by Scripture, the Bible. This is what the church has been doing. This is what our parents have been doing through all our lives. As a mother puts her infant to the breast, so we have been fed from our infancy on a steady diet of God's Word. We have been nourished and nurtured in God's Word, and we must continue in it. Paul encourages Tim Timothy to persevere in the faith by calling him to remember from whom he had learned these things, from whom he had been nurtured. He reminds him that from childhood he had known the Holy Scriptures. Now, Timothy uh, had been raised according to the Jewish tradition of uh, beginning to teach a child when they were five years old. In Acts 16, verse 1, we learn that Timothy was raised by a Jewish mother, though his father was Greek. And in 2 Timothy 1, verse 5, we read of his grandmother, Lewis, and his mother, Eunice, who both, Paul was convinced, possessed a genuine faith. And so Timothy was taught the Holy Scriptures from childhood by these two godly women. And Christianity was exemplified before his eyes through them. And the Lord had blessed him with now a, what was a strong faith. And then Paul took him under his wing. And he accompanied Paul on his missionary journeys and was further instructed in the doctrines of the Christian faith. And so Paul could write to Timothy in verse 13 of chapter 1, Hold fast the pattern of sound words which you heard from me in faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. And in chapter 2, verse 2, Paul could write to Timothy, and the things you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful, faithful men as well. And so Paul had been a blessed instrument in Timothy's spiritual education. But it was not just that Timothy had been taught certain things by his mother and grandmother and by Paul. He had been taught the Scriptures this is what made the most difference in his life. It is the Bible which he had come to know, which we must all come to know and be growing in more and more. The Bible is God's revelation to us, his revelation of himself and his salvation in Christ Jesus. And it is the Holy Scriptures, the Bible, the Word of God that are able to make us wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. It is through knowing the Bible which is more, more than just a, a head and heart knowledge, but it is through knowing the Bible that we grow in wisdom, as opposed to the foolishness taught of the, by the world, because the Bible, the most important thing that the Bible does is it points us to Jesus Christ. It reveals and points us to the one in whom we must believe to be made right with God, to be forgiven of our sins, and to possess eternal life. And this is what must remain our goal as Christians, to learn and be learning Christ through the Bible. This is our task as parents, as church, as Christian schools. The elders' task is to ensure that God's people are nourished, they're nurtured spiritually in God's Word in worship every time we meet together for worship. And as church, it is our, each and every one of our responsibility to pray for our children, to encourage our parents, to bring our children to our catechism and church education classes, to prepare them, to make sure that they come to catechism classes and church education classes are prepared so that they may be learning the content of God's Word. Our teens and young people, our young adults are encouraged to study God's Word together. This year, our women and men and couples meet to, to, together to, to learn what the Bible teaches about the disciplines of, uh, of, the, of Christian living, godly parenting, the sins that lurk in our hearts that we often take for granted, 
the respectable sins as they are so called. And, and we meet together and we study these things because we want to grow in the knowledge of God's Word. There's a reason why we give wedding Bibles when our couples get married. There's a reason why we open our meetings with a Bible reading. There's a reason why we read our Bibles around our tables at meal, meal times, and we are all encouraged to personally read the Bible because the Bible is able to make us wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. And if we are to continue in the things we have learned and become assured of, we must be drawing from and continually growing in our knowledge of Holy Scripture. But as Christ commands us to persevere in our faith in these last days, we also want to be reminded in the second place of the trustworthiness of Scripture. In verses 16 and 17, Paul writes, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. In, in these verses, we're answering the question, how do we know that the Bible is trustworthy? You say, read your Bible, study your Bible, get to know your Bible, be familiar with it more and more. How do I know that the Bible is trustworthy? Because the Bible gives this evidence of itself. The Bible is, a, is the product of the perfect wisdom of a perfectly wise God. Paul encourages Timothy further and us today that we may continue confidently in the things we have learned because the things that we have set before us in the Holy Word of God comes from the very mind of our Creator God. All Scripture is given by inspiration, Paul says. Literally, God breathed, breathed out by God. All Scripture, we have to understand and always rem remember, all Scripture originates with the divine breath of God. Indeed, the Bible is full. We ought not to be surprised to hear that because the Bible is full of examples of the creative breath of God. From the very beginning, in Genesis 1, we read of God breathing into the nostrils of the man he had made from the dust of the earth, and he animated him, giving him life by breathing into him. Or Job 32 verse 8 speaks of the breath of the Almighty giving understanding to man. And so it is the creative breath of God that gives us wisdom and understanding. In Psalm 33, verse 6, we read that the hosts of heaven, that is the stars in the heavens, were made by the breath of the mouth of the Lord. And so creation, this is an ongoing theme in the Bible, creation comes from inspiration. And by inspiration, we mean we're talking about the creative breath of God. And so it ought not to sound strange to us that Paul speaks of the Holy Scriptures as being God-breathed, inspired. The words spoken and recorded in Scripture are a product of divine action. The human authors were powerfully guided and directed by the Holy Spirit of God so that what they recorded, the words that they penned, were the very Word of God. Peter helps us with this in uh, 2 Peter 1, verses 20 to 21. 2 Peter 1, verse 20 to 21, Peter writes, Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation, for prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. As they were moved by the Holy Spirit. The sense of moved in the original language uh, is, uh, is that of, the, of, of how the wind would carry a sailboat along. How the wind would carry a sailboat along. What, how does it do that? It fills up the sails and it pushes that boat forward. And this gives us a sense of how the Holy Spirit moved men to pen the words of Holy Scripture. He gently propelled them to do this work. He stirred them, he actuated them, he led them. And so even though human authors were used, the Bible, we have to understand, is ultimately and exhaustively God's word and God's work. And if it is God's word, the product of his creative breath, it is absolutely trustworthy because it comes from the mind of the one who is perfectly wise and who is the very embodiment of truth. And we may confess with unrestrained confidence that the Bible is then profitable, that is useful, of great practical benefit. It is indispensable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Scripture first of all, is profitable for doctrine, that is, teaching. The Bible is the source of knowledge concerning God and His salvation in Christ. All that we need to know 
about who we are, what we have become, what God has done for us, and how are we to respond to what God has done for us? How are we to live in thankfulness before the Lord our God? All of it is found in the Bible. It contains teachings, doctrine. Now let me ask you something. If the Bible is the most important book on earth, and I don't think anybody would dispute that. If the Bible is the most important book on earth that contains the most important information for human beings, how much do you read it? How well do you know it? You know, wouldn't it be nice to be able to say to the elders this year, not like what we say every year when the elders ask, well, are you reading your Bible? And, and you say, well, not as much as I should. Yeah, I know. Uh, every elder hears this, hears this every year uh, in our visits. Uh, and, and we use this nice little cover that seems to bunch us, in up with, uh, bunch us up with everybody else. You know, yeah, we could always do, always do better. We could all do, all do better. Wouldn't it be nice, instead of saying that to the elders this year, when they ask you about your Bible reading, yes, I read my Bible every day, and I'm learning more and more. As a matter of fact, since your last visit, I committed myself to read my Bible every day, and I have been doing that. And you know what? I'm really growing, and things are really beginning to make sense, and they're all falling into place for me. And my children are growing as well, and my wife or my spouse. The Bible is given for teaching, for doctrine. It's the source of knowledge, and we need to be studying it and growing in it. But the scriptures are also given for reproof, or it's all profitable for reproof. And a reproof is like a correction or a refutation. If there's a dispute or a disagreement about a matter, then scripture must give the final answer. And so when we have a, a, a difference of opinion, or there's a different teaching that comes in, what do we do? We sit around the Bible. We say, what does the Bible say about this? Every lie, every falsehood, every fiction must be challenged by Scripture. Man is good, people will say to us. God will not punish anyone. Jesus was just a man. Satan is not real. Halloween is for Christians too. What do we do? We go to Scripture. We sit around Scripture. All of these lies must be met with a response from the Bible. The scripture, Paul tells us as well, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, it's also profitable for correction. Or we might translate this better, restoration. The word has to do with a setting right. The Greek word has, has to do with a setting right. A seeking to improve the conduct of another person. And so, for instance, if we have a brother or sister who has drifted from the path in some way, it is our responsibility to go to them to seek and restore them. And the, what Paul is saying here is that the most effective weapon that we have in our armory is not how nice we could talk or how intimidating we can be. We have the Bible. We must show them their error from the Bible. Galatians 6 verse 1 tells us, If a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of gentleness. And so, yes, we are our brother's keeper. And the Bible is our tool of restoration. And the scripture, Paul says, is profitable also for training in righteousness. Every child of God must be led in the way of holiness and godliness. Young and old are continually to be educated and trained in the will of the Lord for our lives. Think about it. How do we train up our children in the way that they should go so that when they are old they will not depart from it? How shall we train our young men to be godly, our young women to be pure and self-respecting, our men to be loving husbands and fathers, our women to be respectful and supportive of their husbands and nurturing mothers in the home, our older members to be examples of holiness within the congregation. How do we do this? It is through the Holy Scriptures. It is the Bible, as Paul says in verse 17, that completes us and thoroughly equips us for every good work. The Bible completes us, Paul says. Every believer is a work in progress. God looks at us and he sees an invisible sign that says construction ahead. There's a work that is being done that he is, being, that he is doing in us. We are moving toward and we're growing in the image of Christ who, il, who alone is perfection. We're becoming more and more like Christ. We're being completed. And scripture 
is the instrument that God uses. Scripture has the ability to move us more and more to what that Christ-likeness that is perfection. And it, equip, it equips us for the good works which God has prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. To use the language of Ephesians 2 verse 10. Listen to uh, 2 Timothy 2 verse 21 as well. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified and useful for the master, that is the Lord, prepared for every good work. And so there is a place for good works in the Christian life. There are good works that God has prepared for us. Not to save ourselves, not to make atonement for our sins so that we will be right with God in thankfulness and to show that we are Christians. There are good works that the Lord has prepared for us and that we are required to do. What are good works, boys and girls? It's like evangelizing, so telling people about Jesus, inviting them to church, telling them about uh, uh, correcting them and, and teaching them about what they need to know about salvation. Any kind of acts of Christian kindness that we can perform for anyone visiting people who are sick, any, any acts of hospitality that we can, we can perform to, 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 to those uh, we come in contact with, our brothers and sisters in the Lord, uh, supporting the propagation of the gospel financially, whatever it may be, praying for others. These are good works that we must be engaged in. And God's Word strengthens and prepares us to show the love of Christ that lives in our hearts and it enables us to evidence that we truly belong to the Lord Jesus Christ as we do these good works. God's Word has that ability to move us along and to perfect us so that we are more and more making the hard sacrifices in life, denying ourselves, stepping out of our comfort zones, going the extra mile as we are growing in the knowledge of Scripture. In congregation, these last days in which we live are indeed perilous. And especially for us today, we live in a time and country of great afflu affluence, of relative peace and freedom. We don't face persecution, at least not the violent kind, at least not yet. We're doing well financially that we don't have to really worry from day to day about what we will eat and what we will drink and what we will wear. And so it's very easy for us to become lazy, complacent, taking the Lord for granted, taking our religion for granted, or even becoming self-righteous in ourselves. But you know what? Then we have bought into Satan's lies and we've fallen right into his trap. Let us instead pray for God's guidance and protection in these last days and let us continue by the help of his Holy Spirit through his grace, let us continue in the things in which we have learned and been assured of. Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we are reminded here again, as Paul says elsewhere, that we are, we are running a race. And we pray that we would continue in the things which we have learned and been assured of, that we may finish the race well. We pray that you would convict our hearts of where we have fallen short and where we continue to fall short. Show us our own sloth and laziness, the things that we take for granted, the complacency of our hearts, Convince us more and more as we listen to these words that teach us of the inspiration of the Bible. Convince us of the truth of the Bible and the authority that it holds over us and the blessing that it is to our lives. We pray that you would change our focus from self to you. That all of us may be given to you. We pray that you would bless our elder visit season. We pray that it may be an encouragement to our office bearers and that it may be a blessing to this congregation. And help us, O oh Lord, to live in the recognition that we are called to live for your glory and honor and praise. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Number 411 is our applicatory hymn, How Firm a Foundation, Ye Saints of the Lord, is laid for your faith in His excellent word. Number 411, let's rise to sing the five stanzas.
Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we continue to worship you now by the giving of our offering. You command us in Psalm 100 to bring an offering and come into your house. We pray that we would uh, be mindful that we are to give joyfully and cheerfully in the recognition, Father, that this too is an act of worship. And we pray that you would bless our offering cause this morning for Central Alberta Christian High School. We thank you for the work that is being done as our children are being taught uh, and raised in the teachings of the Christian faith and from a Christian perspective. We thank you that we may have the freedom and financial ability to have such a school and all our Christian schools, and we pray that you would bless it as we as parents have uh, delegated uh, to the church, to the school, to uh, teach our children. We pray that uh, we too would uh, be very conscious of the fact that it is first and foremost our responsibility. Thank you, Father, for blessing us with Christian schools and bless us as we give to what it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. That's right. Congregation, lift up your hearts to heaven and receive the Lord's blessing as we part. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you his peace. Amen. Our doxology is number 491.